Well, tonight we have promised in our title to give you the key to all social relationships. So let's just remember that you are a social creature. You were created by God to be socially connected with him, which I hope we've done some business in thinking through our lives as it relates to God yesterday and today. But all relationships really come down to this one key. So what is the key to all good social relationships? I'm without a doubt, 100% correct in boiling this down to, to one word. And the word in the Bible is the word love. That's the word. It's not as easy to understand as you think. As a matter of fact, all the definitions of love that you've heard in the world right, are not the kinds of, of love that God is talking about. The key that needs to be understood is the one that God has described. And the way I can tell you that it's unique is because the Bible makes it clear that non-Christians can't even do it. As a matter of fact, it is an impossibility as a non-Christian. If you're not related to God and a good relationship with God, you don't have the capacity. Look at how it's put in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. And anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Love is defined biblically. And probably the best place to go for us to camp in tonight is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We'll only get through the first seven attributes of love, but I want to show you that only the Bible can define this. And really, if you're a Christian, you're the kind of person that if you genuinely are rightly connected with God, you have the capacity to actually do this. Other people do not. It's got to come from a definition in the text of Scripture. So let's work through this tonight, and I guarantee you the many facets of this one concept can transform your relationship, and I want to think primarily now tonight of your relationships with other human beings. So let's talk about this. Love is, that's how this starts in verse 4, love is. And um, we need to define it, and I, I will put it this way throughout this discussion tonight, uh, love is love. Love is only love, the only kind of love that's defined by God. God gets to define this term. It is the key to all social relationships. And so we need to understand a definition of that. And we'll start there. Then it says love is, first thing it says is patient. And love is kind. And love does not envy. And love doesn't boast either. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It does not insist on its own way. And that's as far as we'll be able to get tonight. But with each one of these, I want to have at least two resolves in our own heart. So we're going to talk a lot about you making decisions as it relates to what God says you must do to have the kinds of relationships with each other and with everyone else in this world throughout the rest of your life. So we're just going to walk through this. Love is love. What does that mean? Love is patient. Love is kind. Doesn't envy. No boasting. Not arrogant. Not rude. Ah, and doesn't insist on its own way. So those will be the things that we're going to tackle. But first, let's try and define this. Love. We talk about love. It is a kind of disposition. It's a kind of mindset toward others. Let's just talk about other human beings now that we can define as 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 17 says. This is the essence of love. It is that we honor the people because they're people. We honor everyone. We're supposed to honor every last single person that we meet. And as I said on night number one, when you see another human being, right, you are called to honor them. You're supposed to honor every single person. Now, there are some people that are more honorable than others, but this is our, this is our challenge, and it should be our first resolve. And let's put it this way. We're going to do two for each one of these attributes. The first thing I'd like you to commit to tonight, or at some point, we should at least like to have you write it down, is that you're going to pay attention to people. They're special. They're not like anything else. Uh, they're different than a sunset and a beautiful mountain or uh, a, a giraffe or a dog or a, uh, you know, an elephant or whatever it might be. Greater than anything that God created are people. And we need to pay attention to them and we need to give them honor. We need to honor them. So resolve number one, we are supposed to honor people. And, and in some ways, some aspects of that, you think about how the Bible would say you honor someone in giving them respect. Uh, even in Leviticus 19, verse 32, it says, there are things like you standing up because the person is so important. You shall stand up before the gray head, someone who's older. And I told you throughout this week, we'll talk a little bit about how you relate to adults. You should relate to, to adults with more honor than you relate to your peers, people your age. 
You need to show them respect. It says you're supposed to honor the face of an old man and, of course, an old woman. This is not gender specific. You should honor older people. And in this sense, you ought to give some kind of culturally acceptable uh, expression of honor. Let me put it this way. You should not walk past a single person on this whole campus, right, especially if they're older than you and not look them square in the eye, smile at them, and give them respect, a greeting, hello, how are you, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, how's it going, how are you, whatever it is, you need to come out of your mouth with statements of honor and respect simply because they're human beings. Here's the sad thing. If someone walked through the camp tonight after we break and we got refreshments going on and someone came through with uh, a Labrador retriever on a, on a leash, I, I am, I'm sad to mention that you would probably see more people in this camp pay more attention and give more respect and honor to a dog than they would a person. That is just an abhorrent thought to God. You must honor people. That is the apex of creation, right? The immortal soul that resides in, in the heart of every single human being, which does not reside in, in the heart of any animal on the planet that you might admire so much. You, you must take your mind and say, people are in a whole other category. I'm going to do whatever I can respectfully. And by the way, in age, is a big deal here. Um, let's see. Our seniors, how old are, where are our seniors? You got senior, seniors in high school here? How, how old are you? 16, 17, 18, 17? Anybody 18 years old in the room? No? Okay, 17. So let's think about this. 34-year-olds, there's a lot of 34-year-olds along the back or older. They're twice your age. So you could be the oldest student here in high school. And the people sitting along the back have had twice as much experience on this planet than you have. You should give them deference. You should give them honor. You should, you should honor them. It wouldn't even be so bad, although people think you were weird, to stand up when they walk in the room, to offer your hand, to shake their hand, to tell them thank you for being here. They're human beings made in the image of God. They have immortal souls within their own heart. And you ought to grant them respect. And you ought to do that to your peers because they're just, in this case, 17 years away from being twice your age. And it's important that we respect we acknowledge them. We pay attention to people. You should not walk by a person and not look at them and, and, and acknowledge their presence. And sadly, we're all from California. We may be in Arizona tonight. But we're all from California. Go to another part of the country. They still, in many parts of the country, particularly in the South, they still greet each other as they walk down the street. We don't much do that anymore. And shame on us for not acknowledging people made in the image of God. Look them in the eye, respect them, acknowledge them, pay attention to human beings. It is the apex of God's creation. I will pay attention to people and I will honor. If you start right now in your life as a junior high or high school student and say, I will spend the rest of my life paying attention to people and giving them honor and giving them respect, you're going to be ahead of the game, I guarantee you. Your employers in the future are going to notice you. You're going to stand out from the rest. This is a good and godly thing you'll be doing that even non-Christians will recognize as a good thing. Now, I know you've got a lot, of re a lot of reasons not to honor people. But, you know, <clears throat> in that same verse, verse 17, it ends with this. Honor the emperor, who at that time was a man named Nero, and he was a scoundrel of a leader. And then he goes on to say in the next verse, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle masters, but also to the unjust. So you need to understand this. You owe respect and honor to every single human being on the planet. Let's put it this way, whether or not they've earned your respect. And you need to care about them and you need to respect them. You need to acknowledge them. You need to greet them. You need to be there with a sense of attention and honor and care and respect for people, even if you don't think they deserve it. And there's a lot of people in this room you probably don't much care for, but those people deserve your honor more than anything else in all of creation. Because if they're a human being, as I tried to say with a very fancy quote from C.S. Lewis, they're absolutely in a category by themselves on the planet and you ought to take time, no matter who they are, they may be someone that you think is the worst person at this camp, the worst person at your school or wherever you hang out all week, but you need to give them honor. You need to care about them as people, whether they've earned it or not. You make that resolve and you say, there's not anyone on the planet I am not going to give honor and respect and care for, right? You're going to be ahead of the game. I guarantee it. Love is patient. Love is patient. Second thing we need to talk about is the patience of love. 
Let me get specific about a kind of patience that we need to have, because you are probably as impatient as your counterparts who are twice as old as you, because most of us are in, a, in, pa in that we are impatient when it comes to relating to people. And we relate to people, made in the image of God, through communication, through speaking. And the Bible is very clear about this. We ought to know, we ought to be sure, clear in, in our minds about this, that we as people, right, we ought to uh, let every person be quick to hear. You need to be someone who's ready to listen. You need to have that sense where you say, I will patiently listen to other people speak. I will listen intently. I'm not going to listen to them like I'm going to think about what I'm going to say next. Or yeah, what you just said makes me think of something else. So I'm going to dive in and begin to speak over you and tell you whatever's on my mind. You need to patiently wait and listen. And if you could learn this right now in your life to where you don't speak until there's a gap in the conversation, that you don't talk over anyone, you don't start speaking before everyone else that you're sitting there in that circle with is done speaking, right? You'll be doing something very godly to listen and truly, and here's the word I use, sincerely listen to what they're saying, to put yourself in their shoes and try and understand whatever it is they're talking about, something they like, somewhere they went, something they did, something they want to do, that you take your attention and you, you zero in on it, that you are going to patiently listen. So much in the Bible is said about this. Look at Proverbs 20, verse 5 on the screen. The purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. There are, the reason when I say that people are to be honored and respected because they're important. And as people, we need to understand what's going on inside their hearts, deep in their hearts. And the people in this room, right, there's so much we could do to learn about every single person and all the interesting things about every person. But the person that doesn't listen will never draw the intentions, the thoughts, the experiences, the ideals, the aspirations of a person. Never draw them out because they don't listen. Most people in this room and most people in America today do not listen. They don't know how to listen. They don't know how to pay attention long enough to listen. They're impatient and they won't listen and start to get into the heart of someone by listening well, attentively, focused with respect and draw out things within that person's life. And that's why most conversation among you, you peers is just surface, surface, surface. You never get beneath the surface. A man of understanding, a woman of understanding is going to be able to listen patiently, so patiently that they're not going to speak over other people. They're going to wait for a gap in the conversation to speak. And when they do speak, they're going to speak in response to what they've just heard. And that begins to draw a person out. And you'll begin to appreciate people and understand people and see the value and worth in people if you could just learn to patiently and sincerely listen. That's what we need to learn to do. James 1.19, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, he's the other side of the coin, and slow to speak. Here's a commitment you need to make for the rest of your life. I will always try to talk less. I will always try to talk less. I know your parents taught you to talk and you've been talking ever since, but you need to slow down in your talk. You need to listen a whole lot more than you speak. And as others have rightly said, God gave you two ears and only one mouth, and that'll give you some sense of the proportion between your words and your listening. You need to listen twice as much as you speak. You need to spend time saying to yourself, don't say that, hold that back, no need to say that now, don't need to talk about that right now. You need to tell yourself, I need to say less, speak less. Look at Proverbs 18 too, just to drive this point home. It's a fool who takes no pleasure in understanding, they're not good at listening to other people, but only in expressing his opinion. That's what fools do. And if you've ever been in a conversation and just sat there and tried to analyze what's happening, you'll find that it's the foolish person in the conversation that all they want to do is say what they think. Here's what I think. Here's my opinion. Here's what I think. Here's what I like. Here's what I don't like. And all of that, the Bible says, is foolish. You need to go from an adolescent immaturity of foolishness to the adulthood of maturity. And the earlier you can do that, the better where you start to listen and understand and draw the purposes of people's hearts out just by being a good listener and speaking less. I will always try to speak less. One more on this, Proverbs 29, 20. Do you see a man who is hasting his words, just always pouring words out of his mouth or her mouth? There is more hope for a fool than for him. If you talk too much, and many of you in this room are prone to talk too much, right? then you are, the Bible says, are a hope, hopeless case. You're a lost, lost 
hope. You, you, you are going to get yourself into all kinds of trouble. You have to spend time listening and restraining your words. Now, I'm speaking to two kinds of people here. There's the extrovert and the introvert. The introvert says, I don't want to look people in the eye and say hello to them and respect them and say, how are you doing? How's your day? How's it going? Good morning. What are you up to today? They don't want to do what I said at the initial outset of us honoring and respecting people. And then there's those of you that are extrovert and you talk all the time. And you need to learn as extroverts, you need to slow your words down. Some of you don't speak because you're afraid. And that's what we need to get over. Christians are not supposed to be afraid. We're supposed to be bold in obeying the Lord, and the Lord wants you to speak to people. He just doesn't want you to just be hasty in your words, to throw out whatever you're thinking. Commitment number four, I will always try to talk less. Love is also kind. Love is kind. Jesus tells a story about kindness. We call it the Good Samaritan. Do you know the story there in Luke chapter 10? He tells a story about a man who falls among the robbers and he's stripped and he's beaten and then he's left there to die. Now it says, by chance, a priest was going down the road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. He didn't really take the needs of that person into consideration. And the punchline, of course, was there was a man who was a Samaritan and the Samaritans didn't like the Jews, but it didn't matter. He saw a need. He was overwhelmed by that person's need who was beaten on this road and he does all that he can to help him because he is clued in to people's needs. And love is kind. That's kindness in action. And as you love your neighbor, as Jesus put it in Luke 10, you need to be clued into their needs because you're never going to express care and kindness, loving kindness, unless, of course, you know what needs are. So you need to start looking and thinking, what is this person's needs? I've got to think more about what they're going through. How are they feeling? What have they been through? What's it like for them to be at this camp? What's it like being in that group? What's it like being who they are? You need to know whatever their needs are because you're sensitive to them, you're clued into them, you think about them, and of course you're ready to meet them. Of course, that's where we're going next in kindness. We need to not only perceive the needs, we need to do something about it. In 1 John 3, 16 and 17, this is how we know what love is that he, Christ, laid down his life for us, Christians, that we ought to lay then our lives down for the brothers. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and yet closes his heart against him, which is exactly what Jesus said in Luke 10, the Samaritan was the only one who didn't close his heart against the need of that person, right? If he closes, how can God's love abide in him? Well, it doesn't because God's love is the kind of love that's always looking to say, how can I help? And you need to always sincerely ask, how can I help? And if you start getting your eyes up and looking people square in the eyes and greeting them and saying they're human beings made in the image of God, I should respect them and honor them. I should let them speak and I should listen more and I should be clued into their needs. I guarantee you, you're going to find yourself saying when you perceive needs, how can I help? Is there anything I can do to help? I'll bet most of you have walked past at least 50 opportunities to help someone doing something and your heart was closed toward them. And the Bible says, if your heart was closed, you didn't even perceive the need. How can God's love even abide in you? Because that's what love does. It is kind and it does kind things. And kindness always begins by seeing the need and then saying, how can I help? How can I respond? Love is kind. You need to commit yourself, number six, to always asking that throughout your life. And I mean that throughout, when you're 70 years old, if you make it that long, I want you still walking into a room and a situation and whatever it is, the lobby of the church, and you see a need and you ask the question, how can I help? How can I be helpful here? You do that, it's going to transform your life. Love does not envy. Love does not envy. Envy's got a lot of facets to it, but this particular passage always makes me think about what envious people need to do to stop being envious. Envy means that I see people and they are enjoying things, whether it's beauty or brains or brawn or whether they're having experiences or opportunities or they have resources that I would like to have. They have them. I don't have them. So I begin to feel bad that they have them. Well, here's one of the exercises that we can learn to not envy because if you love someone, you don't envy. And, and let's, let's look at a passage that will help us. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 15 through 18. Paul here is pointing out to the Corinthians there were people among them who had devoted themselves to the service of the saints. They'd done something good. 
They'd served other Christians. And Paul says, I rejoiced at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaeus, for they refreshed my spirit and, and as well as yours. So give recognition to such people. You need to be filled with sincere compliments for other people. You need to celebrate what they do. And I'll bet in this room, it's very hard for some of you to sincerely cheer on and celebrate someone who does something good, particularly if it's something you haven't done or you can't do, or they're getting accolades that you would like to get and, cel and celebratory cheers that you would like to get. And you need to say, well, you know what? I need to learn to sincerely applaud that. I need to celebrate that. I need to be able to say you've done a great job and mean it. I wonder how many people in this room are able to say, go, go back to last week, not camp week, but last week. How many times did you really sincerely look someone in the eye for some good thing they've done and say, you've done a good job. I think you're doing great in this. I admire that you've done well. You've done something good here. If you, if you make that the practice of your life, I guarantee you this, you're not going to be an envious person. And real love does not envy. The passage about envy, the first passage about envy is in Genesis chapter 4, when Abel comes to worship and God accepts his offering, and Cain comes to worship and God rejects his offering. It's not told why, but something's wrong with Cain's heart. Cain came to church, so to speak, with the wrong attitude, and God wasn't pleased with Cain, but God was pleased with his brother Abel. So Cain gets mad. And the Lord comes to Cain because he's resentful and bitter toward his brother. And here's what God says to Cain. Why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? Why are you making faces at your brother? If you do well, will you not be accepted? Okay, you don't have what your brother has, but just fix what's wrong with you. Stop comparing yourself to your brother. If you do well, right? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is is contrary to you. It wants to overcome you, but you must rule over it. You got to fight this temptation. Let's just put it this way. You need to always fight resentment. And if I said to you honestly, who in this room or who in your world back in California and Orange County do you resent? I'll bet there's people that play the piano better than you, do soccer better than you, or do better in school than you. Their test scores are, they're someone that does you, does outdoes you in what, what you want to do well in. And all I'm saying is you need to say, I am never going to be comfortable with resentment in my heart about someone who does something better than I do. Resolve number eight, I will always fight resentment. When you see it, just go back to Genesis 4. I need to do exactly what God said to the first resentful man, the envious man. I need to fight it. I need to just worry about myself and do well for whatever God would have me do. If not, this sin is going to overcome me. A lot of people have what you want. I get that. But you just need to understand God does things for other people sometimes that he's not ready to do for you yet. But you fix what's going on in your life and then God will deal with you, right? Cheer on the, the, and celebrate the victories and the accomplishments of others, but don't let your heart ever get resentful. Don't envy. Love does not boast. Love does not boast. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, for who sees anything different in you? If you do something well, you're a standout in school or sports or whatever. You're particularly great at X, Y, or Z, music, you, you name it. What do you, what do you have that you did not receive? Right? Everything comes from God. Every good gift comes from God. If you then have received it, why do you boast? Why do you act as if you did not receive it? Right? Some of you are more attractive than other people in the room. Some of you are stronger than other people in the room. Some of you right, are, are more talented than other people in the room. But here's the thing. All that talent, all that strength, all that beauty came from God. God decided to give that to you. And you can't act like you somehow have that because it's your thing. It's not your thing. God gave everything to you, including every opportunity you've had, how much money your parents make. Whatever it is that you have, God has given that to you. You cannot boast as though you somehow acquired it on your own. Resolve number nine, I will always credit God with my accomplishments. No matter what you have, no matter what you think you have done, no matter what you think you've done. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing that you've accomplished that could have been accomplished if God didn't set you up for that accomplishment. So we give God credit for it. We say that everything good that we have done, every accomplishment that someone else may be prone to envy about us has been a gift that God has given. 
and you just make it your habit. Resolve number nine, I will always credit God with every good thing that I do, every accomplishment that I have, every good grade I get, every goal I score, whatever it is, God is gonna get the credit for this because without God, none of it's gonna happen. No boasting. Well, let's just get right to the heart of what that's all about. The Bible says, let another praise you. If someone's gonna praise you for something good, let someone else do it, not your own mouth. A stranger, someone else, and not your own lips. Let's just put it this way. You need to make the commitment, I will never let me praise myself. And I mean that. You need to just crack down on this. You will never say that you have done a good job. Let someone else say you've done a good job. Don't beg for it. Don't ask for it. Don't manipulate people to get it. Just sit back. If God wants to let someone in your life cheer you on for your accomplishment, great. But you never boast about your accomplishments. And some of you at this age are already really good at manipulating the conversation so someone will say something nice about what you've done. Stop manipulating people and just let someone else get around to it. And they've got to come up with it on their own or you're just not going to get it. And if you get no praise for something you work hard at, something you do well, something you accomplish, oh well. God apparently is trying to test you to see if you'll do it without the praise of people. But love, real love doesn't boast. And make it clear, you were never, ever going to let you praise you. You're just not going to let it happen. That's not what God intends for us to do. This is associated with it, arrogance. Love is not arrogant. Real love which is what you need for all good social relationships, is not going to be arrogant. The arrogant person is not going to have good social connections, just not. The Bible says the first thing you need to think about is how you relate to people. Live in harmony with one another and do not be haughty. That means prideful, but associate with the lowly and never be wise in your own sight. Never. And I know that you already have established at this point in your life a pecking order of who you think is more important than other people and you're better than so-and-so and maybe not as good as that person. Well, remember, resolve number 11, I will never think I'm too good for anyone. Some people that think they're too good for people, right? They end up isolating themselves and excluding themselves. And that's the problem we started with on Monday night. You cannot live in this generation excluded. Everything's working against the connections that God designs for you. And the thing that's going to make this a reality is if you let any arrogance creep into your heart and you think, well, the reason I don't hang out with those people, the reason I don't go to their house, the reason I don't go to their thing when they invite me, I just don't, I don't think they're in my class. I don't think that they're, you know, they're good enough. You may not ever say that out loud, but some of you do. But you need to wage war against that. Resolve number 11, I will never think I'm too good for anyone. You want to stay humble and not arrogant? Love has to do that. Well, here's an easy way to do it. 1 Timothy 1.15. Paul says the saying is trustworthy and it deserves full acceptance. What is it? That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then Paul, the leader of the church, right? He's the missionary who's leading all these churches. He says, of whom I am the foremost. I'm the top ranking sinner. That's how he sees himself. Now he had some thing in his, things in his past that made him say that. But he felt it and he meant it. Resolve number 12. I will remember that I'm a sinner if you are saved. If you are saved, you're a sinner saved by grace. Everyone needs to remember their sin. And they need to say, here's the thing. It just, if nothing else, keeps me recognizing that I am not a Christian because God thought I was better than other people. I'm a Christian because God saw my sin and sent his son to die for that sin. I have to say I'm a sinner saved by grace. And I'll tell you what, if you're arrogant here and you think, well, I'm, I'm not much of a sinner, as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you better take heed. You better be careful because you're going to fall. Because when you fall, then you remember, oh, I guess I am a sinner and I need to be humble. And real love, it's never going to be arrogant. It can't be arrogant. Arrogance kills all relationships. It isolates you. Love is patient. Love is kind. Doesn't envy. Doesn't boast. It's not arrogant and it's not rude. Love is not rude. Some people are rude without knowing, and I don't think anybody in the room is saying, well, I'm purposefully rude. I try to be rude, but a lot of you are rude without knowing you're rude, and here's one of the things the Bible says, is that you can do something that you think is good. Whoever blesses his neighbor, you think, oh, I'm just, I'm just saying something nice, but it's with a loud voice rising early in the morning. 
it's the wrong time. You didn't think about what time it was. Will be counted as cursing. Oh, in other words, I was going to, you know, I wanted to tell them the great news. Well, I didn't realize it was so early. I guess I did realize, but I didn't think about what they were going through. You didn't think about what they were going through, and therefore, you ended up being rude without even trying to be rude. Or how about the invert of that? Proverbs 25, 20, whoever sings songs, right? You want to go and sing a song. You want to have some happy occasion with a friend, but he's got a heavy heart. It's like one who takes off a garment on a cold day or like vinegar on soda that bubbles up and it doesn't taste good. It's, all, it's awful. In other words, here is something you've done to try and say, hey, let's go do this fun thing. And you didn't take into consideration this person's going through a bad time. You weren't sensitive to their needs. Or you're just trying to get a joke across. Proverbs 26, 18 and 19. Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death. So is the man who deceives his neighbor. In other words, you say something's not true, but you're just joking, but it hurt his feelings. And the neighbor, right, is hurt, and you say, well, I was just kidding. See, these, this is a kind of insensitivity to people around you. Resolve number 13. I will think hard about my words, how my words and my actions impact people. This is the thing most people don't do, particularly the people that talk too much in this room. You talk too much, you speak too hastily, as the Bible would put it, and you're saying things that end up hurting people because you're not even clued in to how your words are affecting them. Every single thing you say, you need to ask yourself, how is this going to be heard? How is what I do and what I say going to affect them? Is this the right time for it? Are they in the right mood for it? Is this the right place for it? Is this the right way to say it? And if you slow your words down enough to think about how your words and actions affect people, guess what? You will get good at social relationships. But if you don't do that, if you don't think hard about what you're about to say and how people are going to hear it, then you're going to be really bad at this. And you're going to be increasingly isolated. Always think hard about how my words that I'm about to say or my actions are going to impact you. Well, you want to get rid of rudeness. You think a lot about the need and then you do all you can to meet that need. I love this in 1 Peter chapter 4, as each has received a gift. God has endowed you with certain things. Maybe it's actual stuff. Maybe it's talent. Maybe it's abilities. Well, use it to serve one another. Do something good and positive as good stewards of God's varied grace. A lot of people at this camp helping put this camp on for you. They all have different abilities, and they should do these things, it says, in a particular way. If you're going to speak, right, well, then you speak as someone speaking the oracles of God, which means you ought to say it like this is something they've never heard before. You're peeling back the curtains on the truth. Or whoever serves, let him serve as one with the strength of, with, with God that God supplies. And God is boundless energy, and you should serve with all of your heart, all of your might as though you've got God's energy. Put it this way, Resolve 14, I will always give others my best effort. I will always do my best at whatever I'm going to do to help someone, to serve someone. I will go the extra mile, as I like to say, I'll stay the extra hour. I will spend the extra dollar. I'll do whatever I can as it relates to me ministering to people, helping people, serving people. I'll go, to, I'll go to great lengths to get it done. I can only do so much, but I'm going to do all I can do. If I'm asked to do something, I see a need and I'm meeting it. That's the opposite of rudeness. That's, that's the antidote to rudeness. You will not be a rude person if you give your all to help other people and you're sensitive to what your actions and words are going to do to them. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't envy, doesn't boast, not arrogant. It's not rude. Letter H, it, it doesn't insist on its own way. People that insist on their own way think their way is the best way. And most of you in this room think your way is the best way, whatever it is. I think my idea is the best idea. Well, the Bible says, Proverbs 26, 12, do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? He thinks his way is always right. Well, there's more hope for him, for a fool than for him. Not going to go well for the guy who thinks he knows better than everybody else. How about this one, 12.15 in Proverbs? The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. And some of you will never be good at relationships because you, right, you don't consult, you don't really listen to what other people have to say because you think you've already got it figured out and you start to speak as though you know. And you just got to realize that's not how it works. I'll put it this way, Resolve 15, I will always try to remember I don't know everything. People know stuff that I don't know. People have a perspective that I don't have. 
People know some things that I haven't figured out yet. Now, there are certain things you know, and I get that. And there's a kind and diplomatic way to say those things. But sometimes we need to stand back and say, maybe I don't know everything. Maybe I, I really, matter of fact, I know you don't know everything. And in youthfulness, it's easy to start thinking that you know. There's a lot of things you don't know, and you should humbly recognize that. Let me just add one more perspective to this particular resolve. It really has something to do with the laziness. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. You've got to have a panel of people that can give a great answer, but the lazy guy, he thinks, you know what? I know better. And I know this better than anyone, I suppose. At least all the preachers know what I'm about to say. We can spend hours putting together a sermon and giving wisdom and someone can listen to it and in 15 minutes dismiss all that we've said because he knows better and we may have poured over this in 18 different ways and looked at 25 different books to try and figure out to make sure this is right, but they know better. And oftentimes it's the lazy person doesn't go to the, the effort to work to figure this all out. Just be careful. If you don't see yourself as a really, really, really hard worker, right? then you need to back down on just about every conversation and say, well, maybe I need to do some more research on this. I don't know necessarily. Love doesn't insist on its own way. You know what it insists on? Trying to figure out what your way is and how can I do whatever it is that is helpful for you. I put it this way, 1 John 3, 16. This verse just sums up so much. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Resolve number 16, I will willingly sacrifice for the benefit of others. And that means I'm sacrificing what I would rather do, what I think is the right way, what I think is the good path. I'm willing to do it the way you want to do it. I'm willing to go in the direction you want to go. Now, it's not a sinful direction, but I'm willing to sacrifice whatever's convenient to me, whatever I would rather do. I'll set aside my interests for the interests of other people. Sacrifice. Real love doesn't insist on its own way. It's very reasonable, very flexible. It's willing to negotiate. It's willing to compromise if we're not talking about the truth of God's word. Love is the key, right? Love is patient. It's kind. Love doesn't envy, doesn't boast, not arrogant, not rude, doesn't insist on its own way. If you see these things and you would see these resolves and say, those are things I need to lock my life onto, I guarantee you what that spells, those are the facets of love. And love is the thing that makes all social relationships good. We need to be better at all of those. This isn't complicated, right? It's very simple, but it's very hard. You will spend the rest of your life struggling through those 16 resolves, but I, I think it starts with making the resolves. So let's pray that through right now. God, please help us to make some new resolves tonight to say that we need to grow in the way that we care about people, starting with even tonight, looking people in the eye and caring about people, human beings made in your image. We need to care enough about them, not only to be embarrassed or step out and say things we wouldn't otherwise say, but to be the kinds of people that are ready to look for needs, look for opportunities to serve, give our very best to people when I could be of help to them. God, there's so many things that we do that we don't even think about. We're not even, we don't even have to practice patting ourselves on the back or thinking that we know better. We just do that naturally in our sinful state. So please help us to become aware of what it would be to be the kind of Christian that relates to other people the way that you'd have us relate. And that's really reflecting the love that you say you pour out in our hearts and allow us to connect with people in the way that you taught us to. So God, give us a great sense of resolve and let us come back to these 16 things over and over again that we might learn to love better. And when we love better, God, we know that what you're going to do is to allow us to experience the kind of social connections you've created us to have. We'd like to be better at this, God, and I pray you'd help us to do that by your Spirit's help. In Jesus' name, amen.